What's up, Wildcatters? I'm here today with our buddy JT. You're going to see a whole lot more of. Uh, we actually just shot some real estate content that we're going to be dropping. I don't know if it's going to release before or after this. Um, JT's a successful entrepreneur. Um, you're just going to see more and more of him on the channel with us uh, to help us push out more content. So today we want to talk about, there's a ton of bankruptcies. bankruptcies. Uh, you've got what Hertz filed bankruptcy. We had uh, the biggest one in the energy business recently was Chesapeake. Uh, so we had Chesapeake, you had whiting, you had extraction uh, for oil and gas, but you've had some big names. You've had 24-hour fitness. You've had multiple airlines. Um, and what we want to talk about was if you re if you look at the, the, the pattern between all of these, it's that COVID-19 has become the scapegoat for yep. uh, this is why we're, why we're filing bankruptcy. And it's really masking the fact that perhaps some of these businesses weren't in really good shape before COVID, and now COVID is almost like a blessing for them to go in and file Chapter 11 and allow them to completely eliminate their debt, restructure the business. I think the, and most people probably already know this, but talking about the difference between Chapter 7 and Chapter 11, mm -hmm. right? Chapter 11, uh, bankruptcy does a lot with you're mentioning it restructures the debt doesn't mean that the company's going under. Yeah, the company um, doesn't cease operations. They continue. You know, right. You've got you've got a lot of big names who filed bankruptcy throughout the years. Uh, they continue. Obviously, there's there's usually some kind of trimming of the fat. There's usually some kind of management restructuring. Not always, but at least to to some extent. And the business continues to operate. Uh, now, Chapter Seven, kiss of death. Yeah, that's where they have to sell all their assets. It's kind of like ships burning down and they're jumping ship, you know, abandoned ship. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of companies are, have done that in the past chapter 11, but obviously it does leave a bad taste for the branding. Um, not only for, for, for p potential customers, but also potential investors. Um, so companies like it's something that you don't want to do. You know, you want to restructure debt, but without having to file Chapter Eleven. But I think now with um, the whole virus thing, it's kind of become more acceptable. It's like okay, people get it. So it doesn't really. They've taken on an opportunity and being like, hey, what if we file Chapter Eleven? Maybe the public isn't going to really scrutinize as much as if because of the situation we're in right now, as mm -hmm. we're in before. But a lot of these companies had um, shitty business models and shitty books anyway, and this wow. kind of exposed it. I mean, a lot of retailers, I think uh, uh, Neiman Marcus filed for mm -hmm. um, bankruptcy. I mean, everything is kind of already going online, and this kind of pushes it um, pushes it over the edge. A lot of the companies that have done things right and have innovated aren't really, they're obviously everyone's affected by this, but they're not going to file for bankruptcy. Yeah. With companies like Neiman Marcus, I mean, the writing's on the wall that obviously retail is changing. You've got behemoths such as uh, Amazon. You've got a bunch of other just big players who are either exclusively online or not necessarily have any locations. The question in my mind, especially kind of thinking about what we were talking about the other day was from the real estate stuff, is how do you replace the experience or I guess where is the place for something like experience in the market with something like the retail side because right. I don't go and buy jeans online because just the way that I'm built like I need to try them on and stuff right. do we see big players like Amazon get into into, into I, I starting more I mean they did that with, with Whole Foods right, right. but they I weren't selling groceries online before right I don't think that Amazon's going to start it. I think they'll acquire someone that yeah. becomes the retailer for jeans, for example. Amazon's not going to go out and spin out a jean shop, but they could acquire um, the Whole Foods of jeans or mm -hmm. the Lululemon of jeans. They could yeah. very well go do that. But um, I think everything is going to be more boutique, kind of where you're going to, even like with, I went to the gallery the other day and there's a brand called Tommy John's. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a store and the experience they give you fucking champagne. When you buy really? these underwear, it's like fifty to eighty dollar underwear, and you get a fucking. It's Those like are the ones that uh, Kevin Hart was wearing for a long time, right? He was he was like the the, the spokesperson for right. Tommy John. But it's a whole experience going yeah. in there, and then like looking at this underwear that's like costs as much as a designer pair of jeans, mm -hmm. and then but they're fucking worth it, and they give you fucking champagne or a drink or whatever whatever it is, and they offer like really good. Like if you ever, they tell you if you don't like it for any reason, just return it. Yeah. Um. So I can see. A lot of the different, uh, a lot of the different parts of retailer jeans, shoes, mm -hmm. underwear, going into that kind of boutique, kind of very, um, that experience based uh, of retail. I don't think that a big company 
like a Macy's or JC Penney or Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom are going to be the ones that do it. They might buy them up though. You know, I could see someone like that, um, um, buying them up, but you know, you, they, I think for many years, all these big clothing retailers were focused more on quantity and then not on quality. And then, you know, since like, if you can buy most of the things online and you're giving me not a good experience in store, why not just do it online? Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's just highly convenient to do most of the stuff online. I, I do. I would say that I do most of my shopping online and like pricing. Like even if you go shopping, you might price it like yeah. look, see how much it's priced. The, the good thing about stores like Tommy John's and Lululemon, since they only sell directly, then you can't really find like a price cut mm-hmm. because there's no middleman. You know, all the other brands are are selling to resellers, to retailers. And so then you can find like different coupons or different discount. But like Lululemon, like the price you get on the store, if you go online, it's going to be the same price. Yeah. Because it's just direct mm-hmm. to customer. So I think a lot of that is also going to um, a change that uh, that boutique type of yeah. fashion stuff I think is in. So let's dive into Let's just go through a few different companies and just kind of talk about the landscape. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we're talking, we've talked about recently is Chesapeake. That is by far the biggest bankruptcy, I think uh, of 2020 so far. Uh, the writing on the wall for Chesapeake has been there for quite some time. And the bottom line there is it had nothing to do with COVID. It had nothing to do with uh, Saudi and Russia getting to a pricing war and essentially, you know, shooting the price of WTI through the floor it actually has more to do with the fact that the business model for shale is unsustainable. And if you look at a lot of the other top bankruptcies that we're seeing for 2020, I'm looking at Whiting here, uh, same thing at Diamond Offshore. Obviously, they're they're a driller, but that just goes to show that even even offshore is not doing well. Extraction oil and gas that was like the third largest EMP in all of Denver, Denver, not Denver, all of Colorado, I should say, by volume. Okay, shale is not sustainable. For the most part, gigantic asterisks, there's always exceptions, but for under $80 a barrel, shale is not sustainable. Uh, it's just, it requires a significant amount of debt for the operations to continue. You've got a declining asset. You have to continuously drill for um, for any kind of production growth. Um, and you really, and if you stop that, you're just, it, it, it I don't know how to say it in a better way than that it's just not sustainable. So moving unless on from, you can eliminate the debt. Yeah, unless you can somehow <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, all of a sudden if you file bankruptcy yeah. then it's like, oh, we just eliminated the debt. Now we can kind of restart this, you know, over and over again. There's been multiple energy companies that have filed chapter eleven multiple times. And so you get that coveted chapter twenty two, companies like Halcon, uh, for example. Uh, they were one of them. Um, I don't think anybody's gone three times. I could be completely wrong. Uh, so another big one that's made headlines hurts. But I'm looking here, actual assets twenty five billion, actual liabilities twenty five billion. The re- car rental market, I I feel like that's it's a terrible a terrible industry to be in these days, especially with the rise of Uber, with the rise right. of Lyft. You've got other small startups such as like Turo, where now you can you can rent out your car to other people. A lot of people are still probably sketched out about that, but I think the market is more conditioned now with right. now that everybody's used to Ubering and used to lifting every all, all over the place. Um, so it hurts. That's not really surprising. I feel like this is just kicking the can down the road. Companies like this need to innovate. Right. I mean, it, I mean, you, they could have been potentially maybe even surviving. I mean, they were, I guess they were dying slowly and a lot of these companies were just kind of pushed. To that, it's a commodity. Right? You've got, you, you go to the airport, you're going to run a car, you've got Hertz, you've got budget, you've got four other ones that are all sit there in a row and all you're doing is you're just competing on pricing. Well, and also you got to think about there's, why do people travel? Usually it's business or vacation pleasure, mm-hmm. right? So if I have the option and my company's going to pay for my transportation. I don't want to fucking drive. I don't want to sit in traffic. I'm just going to fucking let them give me Uber or or Lyft credits and I'll just be in my in the back on my laptop or talking on my phone or whatever and I don't have to worry about directions or learning, you know, where places are and then for a vacation unless you have a big fam- I mean, I could see like if you have a big family then you might want to rent, you know, a van or or something like that, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be doing any driving. I just want to be relaxed. And if I'm just going to, if, if it's at similar price points, I might even pay a little bit more just to have like almost like a chauffeur driver just yeah. squirt me everywhere. And on that topic, I mean, thinking about it, so you have a, you have a Tesla model three, right. you said you use the self-driving functionality all the time, but looking at Tesla has talked about, or at least Elon Musk has talked about 
building in this, you know, the, the self-driving ability into all of their cars. And eventually, I think he said, this was probably like six months ago, that a year and a half out, they wanted customers cars to be able to essentially go and and do the whole uber do the ride sharing thing on behalf of the customer to either make them money or make tesla money or make both of them money um but looking at that and then we've known from the beginning or at least i guess a lot of us have known from the beginning that's always been an uber's roadmap it was never really to have drivers it was to have a completely autonomous driving force and to my knowledge i haven't seen anything on the rental market to suggest that they're even remotely considering that right you know, yeah, so you never, how, and, how and they should the be right. right. Th- these are the these are the companies that probably should should be looking at testing for autonomous driving or 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 making those bets or making those investments in in the companies that are that are making the software. Who else we got in here? We got airline companies. Um, airline companies have been bailed out a million different times. Latam Airlines. I don't know who that is. Um, maybe that is that a foreign group? You think? Latam, I think, is from Lat- Latin America. Ah, Latam. okay, okay. I know Aero America was on there um, as well, which is like the the big uh, big airline for uh, Mexico. JC Penny. That doesn't surprise me at all. Once again, we're back on retail. Uh, Neiman Markets. We already talked about that. Uh, let's see. There was a big 24 hour fitness. That's a big one. So a lot of people don't know this. I worked at 24 hour fitness when I was in college as a trainer, made absolutely no money. The business was hurting then. Uh, and the reason being, it's just not really the greatest business model in the world. And for somebody like a 24 hour fitness that used to be considered like the staple, I guess it was like the, the standard for everybody to kind of work towards, it's not really that anymore. Um, right. When you've got and you've got other competition, like such as like a fitness connection that I would consider to be another big box gym, that arguably has better facilities, uh, and it's a fraction of the cost. And I think the other part is also is you've had things like Orange Theory, Spenga yeah. pop up, which CrossFit, is, which is very boutique and almost like the same thing. We we're talking about Tommy John's and, and and fashion. It's when it becomes boutique and tailored, the experience. It's just a lot fucking better, mm-hmm. like um, or Soul Cycle or these bar or all these little cycle bars that are popping up and um, boutique fitness gyms, you know, kind of draw draw a cloud and a different type of crowd. They hold you accountable. You see you see results. Um, you know, I I wonder. I've never seen the statistic how how many of the memberships at twenty four like how often they were used. There was a big, so whenever I was there, I mean, this is a decade ago. Um, I want to say the location that I was at, I think we had 50,000 members that used it as its primary location. And I think it was under eight or 9,000 that used it more than a few times a month. Right. And so they made a lot of their money off members who were not paying, or they were paying for it, but they just weren't using it. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of churn when, whenever you have something. Yeah, like I mean, you got to think you're paying massive, massive rent for these lo- huge locations. Um, I think they screwed up by never reinvesting into a lot of the equipment. But I think the big, the big takeaway with this one is that, like you mentioned, people want to be a part of tribes, and if you have smaller classes, like the biggest, the most popular things at 24 wasn't the free weights. It was, it was the spend classes. Right. It was the the group fitness. People like to find those kind of things to belong to. And I think CrossFit gave them that. I think the Spenga, I think F45, Orange Theory, you name it. Those just seem to be a better fit. And I think the normal gyms that are going to thrive are the ones that are specialized, whether it's on bodybuilding, whether it's on powerlifting. It's those are the fanatics yep. that regardless of whether a pandemic is coming or right. not, they're going to pay and they're going to go. Exactly. You know, and then the same thing with like a, like an, I would say the same with Equinox, but even them, I know they are currently hurting as well. I would not be surprised to see Equinox file bankruptcy. Yep. So, yep. Uh, who else is on here? Circus Soleil. Well, they closed down all of the Broadway shows and everything. They yeah. closed it down. It's like 3,500 jobs lost. Um, yeah, that sucks. So... Anyway, so, we, so we've gone through a lot of the biggest I guess I do want to know, I do want to say, like, just be, not all the companies, I think, were hurting, although they could be. But there's also the possibility where they just, you know, took the opportunity, let's restructure some debt. Yeah. Um, I would, But I would say the majority were already companies that were on the brink. Mm. Um, yeah, Chapter 11 can be a tool. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I just think that, that COVID-19 has 100% become the scapegoat 
for a lot of these businesses that have business models that just need to be uh, either rethought or disrupted. Yep. Uh, I think they need to be looking towards the future and, and paying attention to a lot of the bigger trends. So a lot of the um, like the companies like we we touched upon before we before we got on the podcast Peloton. Mm, um, yeah, a lot of those kind of companies that are direct to customers. You know, they don't they don't sell it to to a retailer or a third party. I think they're not they're not hurting. I mean, they're looking in towards how can you make life more efficient and easier for people? And, mm-hmm. and those companies, you know, regardless virus or not, you know, they thrive. Um, one of the things we're talking about, yeah, before we hopped on the mic was that, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversations just amongst us saying that, you know, Apple is 100% becoming a service company while they still make the devices and stuff. If you're looking at the, some of their filings, a lot of their growth is coming from the services business. And that's because now they can charge you for iCloud. They can charge you for a variety of other things that are just built into your phone, built into your, yeah, built into your podcast music, all of it, you know, various apps. So they make money in every app that you buy from the app store. Um, So it's a big part of their business. And Peloton is the same thing with it being direct to consumer. These guys have gotten the, the, for one, it's a cult following and you'd never really want to bet against something that has a cult following. Right. They've provided everybody with the hardware direct to consumer, not having to go through distributors. And then lastly, now they're, they're finding new ways to upsell through services and at the same time, touching back to what we already talked about, now you've got this this tight knit group of people who are finding a way to belong to something, right. which is no different than the other places that we've mentioned. Exactly. So those guys are going to be the clear winners. So um, hopefully, this should shed a little bit of light into maybe some of the differences between. Um, I mean, this is not a full on definition between chapter eleven and, and, and chapter seven, uh, but we wanted to hit on why a lot of companies were kind of blaming COVID-19 for, uh, for them filing bankruptcy, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it allows them to restructure, get debt off the balance sheet, uh, possibly make some, um, you know, trim, trimming the fat a little bit here and there, uh, probably some layoffs, some furloughs, some management changing. Um, but these guys will not be ceasing operation. Um, and they'll continue. Uh, usually, usually restructurings take about nine, 10 months to come out the other side. Uh, and hopefully look to disrupt their own business model so they don't have to do this again. But they probably won't. They probably won't. They yeah. probably won't. Most of those big companies are going to be replaced by startups in the next five years, I would uh, predict. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So if you guys like this, uh, just smash the like and subscribe button. Uh, if you want to see some more commentary, uh, just casual content that we're looking to create, uh, let us know in the comments below. We'll catch you guys in the next one.